Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the last wrestling podcast, because if I've got a wrestling podcast, that means absolutely everybody else in the world does too, and the entire concept is officially played out. All right, it's that time of the year again, WrestleMania! And yes, I am going to be doing a new format for this. It's going to be a live-ish review. As I am recording this, I have not seen the show. I don't know what happens. I have been completely avoiding spoilers. I've been off of Facebook, off of YouTube, off of everything. I don't know what's going to happen. I have the show queued up on my computer. I'm going to watch a match, and then I'm going to talk about it. And we'll basically see how long it goes. And I'm going to tell you how long it takes before I have to take a break. Because this is... A five-hour-plus wrestling show. There is no way on God's Mostly Blue Earth I'm going to sit through all of that in one sitting. No way I have... Well, I don't really have a life, but I have a job. And I occasionally have to, you know, eat and sleep. So, that's not going to happen. And for the first time in the history of the last wrestling podcast, I actually watched the pre-show matches. Two-hour pre-show. So if you want to see the entire WrestleMania experience, you had to sit for over seven freaking hours. That is way past too long for a wrestling show. All right. Uh, so what I did was I didn't watch any of the commentary or any of the, the jibber-jabber. I basically cut to what, you know, I cut as far as I could to what looked like a match. Uh, the first match was the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royale. No entrances for anybody. JR and the King calling the match, which was cool to hear. Um, this was terrible. For the most part. Uh, this was pretty much the Jobber and Tag Team Battle Royal. The one interesting spot mid-match that I saw was Goldust throwing... Our truth over the top rope down to the floor and then doing a dab. Anybody remember when that was a feud people had hopes for? <laughs> we get down to the final three of the contest, which are Woken Matt Hardy, Mojo, I can't believe he still has a job, Raleigh, and Baron the Disappointment Corbin. And the announcers actually pointed out that two of these three are former Andre the, Memo Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal winners. Um, don't rub that in, because where have their careers gone since then? Absolutely nowhere, because they're right back in this, what's supposed to be the, you know, the up-and-comers battle royal, but what's actually the way to give everybody a, a payday. Um, oh, speaking of which, there's probably going to be some pissed-off wrestlers, because... If you're on the pre-show, you're not getting paid WrestleMania money. There's, you actually don't get your WrestleMania bonus. From what I understand of how the pay system works in WWE, it's incredibly arbitrary, it's stupid, and you basically get paid whatever Vince thinks you are worth. So it comes down to Raleigh and Corbin beating up on Woken Matt Hardy. And then the Bray Wyatt uh, video effect hits. Bray Wyatt shows up. And Wyatt is now working with Hardy. He has been awoken. He has been cleansed of the spirit of Sister Abigail. Which is delightful. I'm not going to do the, the Hardy voice. And, um, yeah, Hardy wins with the help of Bray Wyatt to claim the Andre the Giant Memorial Trophy. I cannot wait to see what Woken Matt Hardy does with that trophy. It's going, to, it's going to have the soul of Andre the Giant in it at some point, I'm imagining. Okay, the next match was for the Cruiserweight Championship, Cedric Alexander versus Mustafa Ali in a tournament final. I'm going to be honest with you, I have not been watching 205 Live, despite the fact that I really do like some of the wrestlers on that roster, number one being Drew Gulak. And if you're a Chikara fan like me, you know why. And I'm not going to tell anybody else, because kayfabe. And... I didn't know who these guys... I, I knew of these two guys. I didn't know the story going into the match. They seemed to both be baby faces to me, which is never really a good thing. You should try to have the face heel dynamic whenever you can. But I will give some credit to Mustafa Ali for probably the coolest ring, in, 
ring gear I've seen in a long time. He had this glowing LED mask that he wore for the entrance, and he had what looked like an Iron Man um, sort of repulsor ray. He had a very Iron Man-like outfit, and it looked like he he was, you know, s shooting a laser beam into the camera. It was really, really cool. Good cruiserweight action, high-flying, some really impressive and pretty dangerous looking spots. And I it was a good it was a good match. It was as good a match as it could be given the time slot, given the uh the amount of time they were given, given the story they didn't have to work with, and given the fact that I had no idea who either of these two guys were. Uh in the end, Cedric Alexander wins to become the new cruiserweight champion, and we all get to pretend Enzo Amori never existed. Yay. Third match on the pre-show was the, oh my god, we can't actually call it that, let's come up with something else, Women's Battle Royal. Now before I get to this actual Battle Royal, um, this trophy, am, am I completely out of my mind, or is that a uterus? The way the handles of the cup look like, kind of like fallopian too. Is this the Vagina Trophy? I, am I completely out of my mind? Tell me in the comments. Am I out of my mind here? This is a Vagina Trophy. Vince... Uh, every time I think they're making progress towards having a legitimate women's division, they do something stupid like this. And then the match happened, and then more stupid happened. Okay, it come, there was, I think, about 20 women, about half of whom were from NXT, so it was pretty obvious that they were stretching to fill out uh, this battle royal. No real surprises from the past in the match. Uh, Beth Phoenix on commentary was very good. Paige on commentary was really, really sad. I, Paige just makes me feel sad now. You know, find her something to do that she's actually into, or, I'll be honest, pay her to sit home and heal, hopefully. Okay, uh, we get uh, about 20 women in the Battle Royal. It comes down to, or it appears to come down, spoiler alert, it comes down to Sasha Banks and Bailey, who have had this are you my friend, are you not my friend thing going on a lot longer than it should have, and frankly, both of them look pretty terrible at this point. So, in the end, Bailey throws Sasha Banks out. She thinks she's won the match. Curiously, the bell has not rung, because Naomi, who had slid out of the ring earlier under the ropes, so not eliminated, uh, comes back in the ring and throws Bailey out, and Naomi is the winner of the first... Uh, vagina Memorial Battle Royal. Yay for her, I guess. But when is WWE going to figure this out? People want to cheer Bailey. Bailey should be the next John Cena in terms of kid-friendly merchandise juggernaut. Guys want to wear the I'm a Hugger t-shirt. How are you still, years into this now, how are you still fucking this up? So they, they looked like they gave us the moment that we all wanted and then snatched it away. You can do that as a storyteller. Sometimes you have to do that as a storyteller. But do it too often and the reader stops trust, or the viewer in this case, stops trusting you to actually have the good guys win in the end. So big disappointment there. Good for Naomi, I guess. And we'll see what the Vagina Trophy does going forward. That's it for the pre-show, and from what I've got here, we're uh, the first match on the show is for the Intercontinental Championship three-way match between defending champion The Miz, Seth Rollins, and Finn Balor. No idea if he's going to be the demon, but it's WrestleMania, so I imagine he will. All right, I'm now going to watch the match. Good opening match. Wow. Um, okay, before we get into the match itself, some notes on the set and the entrances. The last few years, I've really had a problem with WrestleMania stages and entrance ramps because they've been too long, 
and they've been too wide and the signs have been too high, meaning that the wrestlers look tiny. The wrestlers look insignificant on the stage. Well, that's not what's supposed to be. The wrestlers are supposed to look larger than life. This year, because of the New Orleans setting, they've got this big Mardi Gras carnival mask uh, on the front of the stage, which they are using to good effect in some of the videos. But that forces the eye to draw attention to under the nose bridge of the, ma of the mask, which is where the wrestlers come out. And that focus is really helping... Um, is really helping you to ignore the, the empty space on the side of the stage. So it does a good job of being big, spectacular, WrestleMania-worthy, but still not making the wrestlers look like miniature action figures. Seth Rollins comes out first, doing a Game of Thrones reference. Uh, he does the whole burn it down thing. And we get Pyro, actual Pyro in WWE again. Wow. And then everything turns to ice because they're doing Game of Thrones, White Walkers, The Winter Has Come. And Seth Rollins comes out with White Walker ice zombie contact lenses and looks really cool. Second, unusually, is The Miz. Normally the champion comes out last. The Miz comes out and tells the Miz Taraj, his minions, to go back, that he's gonna to this backstage, that he's going to handle this himself. They seem to be trying to turn the Miz babyface here, because in real life, uh, Mike Mizan and his wife recently welcomed uh, their new daughter, their first child, into the world. Congratulations to both of them, of course. And they're trying to tell the story that fatherhood has changed the Miz. And that now he realizes he wants to be a role model for his daughter. So this is why he's cheating a lot less and why he's not relying on the Miztourage. Well, okay, good. If that's the story you want to tell, fine. But you've got so many good baby faces, granted that you're not working anything with, you're not using well, but the Miz is one of your best heals he gets that that isn't named roman reigns he's i would say the miz is the best heel in wwe who is positioned as a heel and by the way i've, I've stopped i'm just going to start using heel and babyface it's common enough that everybody who watches wrestling knows these terms i'm just going to go with it uh then finn balor comes out i was wrong not the demon as the man Surrounded by the LGBTQ contingents of the Balor Club. Um, he's got some um, rainbow flag uh, gear. Basically, the, the Balor Club symbol looks like a rainbow uh, Shazam logo. Or Captain Marvel logo, for people who actually remember when the comic was good. And he's coming out as a human he's with this, this message of inclusiveness, which I think is fantastic. And then I remembered Vince McMahon's politics. Vince McMahon is buddy-buddy with Donald Trump, and Vince's wife works for the Trump administration, which is the most flagrantly anti-LGBTQ uh, administration that America has ever had, at least until, you know, Trump quits and Mike Pence becomes president. Ugh. So, good message, but really brought down when you consider who is running this show. Also, Michael Cole sounded like he never said the phrase LGBTQ in his life. Match itself. Fantastic action. Lots of high-flying. Lots of quick roll-ups in the beginning. Um, good, uh, Lots of dives. Some really cool high-risk spot. A good callback in continuity to when um, Seth Rollins injured the shoulder of Finn Balor, he teased doing that buckle bomb or that power bomb into the guardrail again, uh, but this time Finn escaped. Very, very good. Lots of counter wrestling, some, in, some creative breakups. There was one time when The Miz had Finn Balor in the figure four leg lock, and Seth Rollins does a huge splash off of the top rope to break that up. Another when um, 
Finn does the coup de grace to break up a cover. In the end, um, essentially a, a double curb stomp. I think they're calling it the blackout now. Uh, or they're calling it something. They're not calling it the curb stomp. Are they calling it the curb stomp? I didn't even notice. Double curb stomp to both Ch um, Miz and Balor, followed by another curb stomp to the Miz. Rollins pins the Miz to become the new Intercontinental Champion, and apparently a Grand Slam Champion. They hammered that home pretty well. Great match for its position on the card. High energy. Got the crowd into it. Well done. Oh yeah, before I continue on to the next match, um, two women I've never heard of sang America the Beautiful, and they seem to sing an extended version of the song. They repeated the last verse a couple times. And not to sound unpatriotic, <laughs> but yeah, if it's not directly related to the wrestling, you don't need to make it any longer than it absolutely needs to be. I don't even know why they sing America the Beautiful in the first place. Shouldn't they be singing the national anthem? Oh, well. What's the next match? Okay, it looks like the next match is going to be Charlotte defending, or Charlotte Flair defending the SmackDown Women's title against Asuka. I'm honestly surprised this is this early on the show. This is a... But before I continue, this is a stacked card. There are a lot of really good matches. The only... The only one that I think doesn't qualify as a an upper card WrestleMania match right now is the U.S. title Fatal 4-Way because, well, I don't care about it. And it seemed kind of hurriedly rushed together. But yeah, okay, we're going with Charlotte and Asuka and I'm going to watch the match. Charlotte was ready for Asuka. Wow, I was not expecting that outcome. Charlotte, your winner by submission and still SmackDown Women's Champion. This was a beautiful match. Start to finish, fantastic. The story was so simple, it was elegant. The undefeated Asuka versus the champion she has never faced. Asuka winning the first ever Women's Royal Rumble to get a title shot against the champion of her choosing. She chooses to cross brands to face Charlotte, and I'm so happy she did. It was a wonderful match brilliant. I, I, I don't have enough superlatives to explain this. It was a work of art. You owe it your, you owe it to yourself to see this contest. But in the end, Asuka's streak has been broken. And now the question is, one, was giving the streak to Charlotte worth it? And two, where does Asuka go from here. She's not the undefeated Empress of Tomorrow anymore. So, you know, can she maintain her aura of badass without the streak? I don't know. I think she can, and I really hope she does. Uh, a couple of details from the match. Some great entrances again. They've been just knocking out of the park with the entrances so far. Charlotte comes out on a throne flanked by three sort of Roman centurions and I and she starts off her entrance with her father's old theme music. It eventually transitions into hers once she gets off the throne, is bathed in golden light and makes her way about a third of the way down the ramp. I'm hoping these were references to her father, the golden light referring to the flare for a flare for the gold. And the Centurions representing a maybe a bit of an in-joke to the time WCW wanted Ric Flair to shave his head and put on a Centurion outfit and call himself Spartacus. Yes, that really happened. No, he didn't do it. So I hope that was an in-joke. I really do. Asuka comes out, and they did this with The Miz as well, 
what looked like CGI projections in the arena. Were those holograms? Were those really there? Because I, I don't think so. I think they were just CGI'd in. But, you know, hologram technology to not, these days, you know, you can almost think they could get away with it. Uh, Asuka comes out in a jeweled version of her No Mask of Feminine Serenity. And, yeah, that was pretty cool. But she didn't get, other than the the laser projections and the mask projections, which I don't think the people in the arena saw. Please let me know if I'm wrong about that. And she, it was, I, I, I can't get over how good a match this was. You know, Charlotte with one arm bridging up into the figure eight to win the match. A super, in the AWL, I, call, I would call it a super endless light, super Spanish fly, uh, off of the top rope incredible for a women's match um just this was excellent storytelling two athletes desperate to prove themselves desperate to prove who was the best i i cannot heap enough praise on this i loved it now after the match we had a little bit of an angle because as charlotte is make oh well, two two things happened after the match one oscar got on the mic and said what i started the segment with Charlotte was ready for Oscar, and congratulations. And they hugged in the ring, and pure sportsmanship from Oscar. No heel movement from anybody. Both women come out of this looking babyface. It was great. Uh, the question is now, what's next for Oscar? The second angle that happened, as Charlotte's making her way up the ramp, a referee runs down the side of the ramp like a bat out of hell and runs past the ring over to where John Cena was. Uh, throughout the show, John Cena has been sitting. Um, okay. As the hard cameras looking at the ring, the right, the, um, the upstage right hand side. Yeah. Up, upstage stage, right. Um, assuming you're sitting at the hard camera and the referee runs out there. I thought there was some kind of an, uh, an altercation like a, a a drunk fan got into it with Cena because they've had a they also had a bunch of security around there trying to stay out of the camera shot but <laughs> weren't quite succeeding the referee jumps the barricade whispers something to or says something to Cena it sounded to me like the undertaker's backstage the undertaker is here the story with John Cena is he's been calling out the undertaker for a match of WrestleMania an Undertaker has not responded. He has not appeared. He has sent no message except uh, Kane saying that demons who rest do not wish to be disturbed. But so far we've gotten nothing from The Undertaker. No yes, no no, nothing. So at hearing that The Undertaker is in the arena, uh, Cena jumps the barricade, which by the way, even if you are a ticket-buying fan, you're not allowed to do jumps the stage jumps jumps into uh, jumps the barricade runs past charlotte i think he gave her a thumbs up a good match or something on his way up but just dashes past her uh backstage and we don't see him again charlotte and oscar look at this and sort of okay what was that all about fantastic 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 match find it it's got if you haven't seen it find it and it looks like the next match is going to be the Fatal 4-Way for the U.S. Championship. And I, as I'm saying this, I'm having trouble remembering who's in the match. I know Bobby, it's Bobby Roode, Randy Orton, uh, Rusev, and somebody else. Jinder Mahal, that was it, Jinder Mahal. That's how, that's how bad this is, I'm having trouble remembering who's in the bout. Well, that was certainly a match that happened. Okay, um, well, let's just go through it. Entrances. Pretty much everybody got their standard entrance. Uh, so once again, Randy Orton gets shafted on the WrestleMania super entrances. He's made some public comments about that in the past, that he never gets the big elaborate entrance. Sometimes he gets to walk down the ring looking like he's riding a giant sperm, but he never gets a cool entrance. 
Well, that continued. Uh, result of the... Uh, basically, this was a paint-by-numbers match. Everybody got their stuff in, and everybody got their moment to shine, and in the end, somebody won. And that somebody was the modern-day Maharaja, specifically Jinder Mahal. And I don't know where they're going with this. The Jinder Mahal experiment was a colossal, or colossus, or coloss, or whatever he calls his finisher, failure. It was a terrible idea. They shouldn't have done it. They pulled the plug on it before the Big India show, where Mahal lost. And no, I'm sorry, it's just not working. You want to have an Indian superstar to you know, expand into that market. I get that, but he was a terrible heel. They made him a racist caricature, and then they made the character a racist in his feud with Shinsuke Nakamura. Well, he's now the U.S. champion, and frankly, I don't care. Why Rusev didn't win this match, I do not understand. Rusev Day is probably the most over thing with the fans... It's, it's not over in a main event way, I get that, but it's over in a U.S. title way. So why this happened, I have no idea. At this point, I would have um, Aiden English and Rusev create the Rusev Day Championship and have Rusev carry that belt around. It could, it's going to make the thing last another few weeks. That would work. Um, before I continue, I just want to talk about how bad the booking was leading into this match. Because this was pretty much the exact same match as the triple threat for the Intercontinental title, only with another guy in it. And a guy that it felt like they were adding to the match almost out of you know, obligation, and that being Rusev. I do wonder if the Raw and SmackDown writing teams ever talk to each other and say, you know, hey, we're doing this story, you know, this is what we're doing, would you guys mind, mind not doing the exact same thing for at least a couple of months? And I don't know if they do that. If they don't, they should. The match wasn't exactly a stinker, but this could have been the main event of any given episode of SmackDown. <sighs> There was also a commercial after the match, a Fashion Files Mick Foley Snickers commercial that was actually kind of funny. Credit where due. All right, what is next on the agenda? Okay, they are apparently doing the mixed tag match with Ronda Rousey and Kurt Angle versus uh, Stephanie and Triple H. I honestly did not expect this to be this early on the show. We're barely, let me check the time, the timeline here. We're like an hour and 20 minutes into the show, which means we've got like three hours 50 left or something like that. So yeah, I'm shocked this is this far down the card. Um, okay, let's see if... Uh, before I, before I start, before I watch the match, I wanna I wanna speak out against a lot of the internet wrestling community here. I have been loving Ronda Rousey. A lot of people have been criticizing her for the fact that she can't act, which is true, and the fact that the few wrestling moves she's done so far have looked pretty terrible. Credit that is technically correct. However. I completely believe this woman as a badass. Her inflection, while not polished, seems more natural. Real people are not polished speakers. So, she sounds like a normal human being plunked into the overly scripted world of WWE. So, I actually think that's a good idea. More of that, please. More talking like a human being. Um, as for the rest of the story, it's been okay. They've clearly had to um, work around the fact that they didn't really want to have Ronda on every show, even though they kind of advertised that. 
um, the uh, they've got to hide. They there's so much they've got to hide around here. Actually, now I'm talking myself into understanding why this is so far low, so down on the card. Stephanie's not a wrestler. Triple H is still able to go, but he's into the Undertaker, Shawn Michaels, wrestle once a year category. Um, Ronda is, for all intents and purposes, while she's clearly an athlete, a great athlete, when it comes to pro wrestling, she's green as goose shit. And Kurt Angle is, frankly, a you know, an old sack of loose bones at this point. We saw him in the six-man tag, or I think it was the six-man tag, at Survivor Series with The Shield. And he was kind of exposed a little bit in that. And that was when they had a lot more people to cover for him. And he's expected to cover for Ronda. So maybe they're putting this where it is because they don't have high hopes for the match. All right, going to stop now, watch the match, see what happens. That went a hell of a lot better than I expected it to. Okay, that was not a wrestling match. That was a magic show. A lot of tricks, a lot of smoke and mirrors, covering for the fact that, frankly, nobody in this match was a good wrestler. Uh, the first half of the match was... okay. First, I have to set up the uh, the entrances. As one might expect, Triple H and Stephanie got the cool entrance, whereas Rouse, uh, Ronda Rousey and Kurt Angle got the normal entrance. Uh, Triple H and Stephanie coming down as part of a biker gang, and there was a horrible moment right as the song was playing, and... Uh, Stephanie and Hunter were in the back of the biker gang, the sort of Amazon brigade, and Triple H starts to fumble with uh, his bike, and it looks like the bike had uh, had stalled or had shut off or something. And I was thinking, oh god, the girls are going to ride down, and then the other two are going to have to get off and walk. <laughs> That's going to be fun. Fortunately, that didn't happen. The bike, went, the bike thing went off without a hitch. And it looked really cool. I love the laser, the ring of laser effect. Um, on Stephanie and Triple H when they were in the ring, I thought that was I thought that was great. Again, when they've decided to go full out with the entrances, they've been nailing it. Uh, you know, there has not been a single Randy Orton snake sperm the entire time. Kurt Angle comes out and gets pretty much his standard entrance, but considering he's a nostalgia act, that's kind of a good thing. Uh, he actually even got his pyro back. Yay! I'm gonna be harping on the pyro thing because. I know it's expensive, but it adds so much to the presentation to the show. I just... I don't know why they got rid of it. It's dumb. Okay. So, Kurt comes out. Rousey comes out separately. And she came out to her... What I guess now is standard, bubbly, bouncy, um, almost Bailey-esque uh, Rowdy Roddy Piper tribute. Which was fine, but for the match itself, for the big match... I would have given her more of an MMA entrance. I would have had I would have had her, you know, in the robe with the hood. You can do the you can do the jacket, you can do the the tartan skirt, you can do the Piper tribute. But I would have had her in game mode, in fight mode from the word go and have her flanked by a posse. And you know what? Bring in Shayna Baszler, the new uh, NXT Women's Champion. Have her show up. As a, as a second, uh, have the 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 Rousey camp, you know, maybe for real, have her have her people show up as her escort, like you do in MMA. But for what they did, it was okay. Match itself, the I liked the opening was basically Triple H and Stephanie cheating around the no intergender uh, contact. I'm not a fan of this. If you're going to have mixed tag matches, it needs to be equal rights and equal fights. And the men get to wrestle the women, the women get to wrestle the men, and vice and and all of that. But under WWE mixed tag team rules, the men wrestle the men, the women wrestle the women, and never the twain shall meet. In fact, a tag on one side is an automatic tag on the other. 
Well, that did add to the drama here because that was the rule that Stephanie and Hunter were regularly breaking the entire bout. Um, so, okay. Somewhat surprisingly, although it shouldn't be considering the buildup, the entire story was about Ronda Rousey getting her hands on Stephanie McMahon. Triple H and Kurt Angle were kind of afterthoughts in this, and that shock, that should be a shock. The idea that Triple H versus Kurt Angle at WrestleMania is an afterthought, I... You, you've, you've written yourself into a hole when that's the situation you find yourself in. But in the end, justice prevails. Rhonda gets her hands literally on Stephanie. And really nice finishing sequence as she's about to put... Stephanie throughout the entire match has been blocking, has been clasping her hands to block the cross arm bar. Or the, the jujigatame. And just as Rhonda's about to put it in for the final time... Stephanie is begging, saying, No, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. The hold is applied for a grand total of half a second before Stephanie immediately taps out. And they play it up like she broke, uh, that the Rhonda broke Stephanie's arm. So, all in all, very well done. Interesting to see Dana White in the crowd. Um, you know, in a Ronda Rousey t shirt. And he seemed to genuinely, genuinely be supporting her. Um, what this means, if anything, for the future of MMA, of UFC and WWE, I don't know. But all in all, a lot of smoke and mirrors, not a lot of wrestling skill, although Ronda surprised me. She was still, like I said earlier, green as goose shit, but... She didn't look like she was having her first match. And credit where due, they got it. They managed to get this out of her. But much like with Asuka, I don't know where they go with Ronda Rousey from here. What, I mean, okay, her next obvious feud is to go after Charlotte. But as far as I can tell, she's a raw wrestler. Now, are they planning a superstar shakeup draft? Brand, you know, whatever they want to call it, I don't know, but I'm not looking. I'm not really interested in Ronda Rousey versus Alexa Bliss, assuming Alexa's still champion at the end of the night. Ronda Rousey versus Nia Jax, I'm not horribly into either. Uh, but Ronda Rousey versus Charlotte Flair, that I could get into. I could see Stephanie firing um, Ronda as out of spite and she and her saying okay um well i figured you might do that so i called your brother and i've got a nice uh cushy contract waiting for me on smackdown and uh he's paying me more than you are so bye i don't think ronda rouse would actually say bye all right um i'm gonna i'm gonna call it for right now I'm gonna call this part one I don't know if I'm even going to actually split the thing up into multiple videos. I might, I might not. But I need to take a break because checking the video here, we are about two hours into the show, three hours, 15 minutes to go, and I'm, I'm starting to fade. You can probably hear it in my voice. Uh, I'm going to come back to this as soon as I'm ready to watch more of the show, and uh, see you then. Of course, no time will pass for you, but uh, I may be distinctly older. <laughs> See you soon. And we are back for a very brief part two, because I managed to watch a match before I have to head off to work. Uh, I have mixed feelings about this. This is a triple threat match for the SmackDown Tag Team Titles. And I completely forgot this match was happening. Uh, the New Day came out first, and I was thinking, wait a minute, are they, are they hosting WrestleMania again? And then I remembered, no, wait a minute, there is actually a match here. Um, I don't like the New Day. I don't like Vince McMahon's happy, bouncy black people, as I call them. And um, I will give some credit. While their entrance was incredibly stupid, stupid and more than a little offensive to several groups the fact that Xavier Woods used the 
Green Ranger, Dragon Dagger, Dragon Caesar, uh, calling sound, the do 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 in order to summon, can't believe I'm about to say this, to summon the pancake little people. <laughs> Was actually kind of funny. I like the fact that he used the, the Dragon Dagger song. Doubt Vince got that. But one point. They also had a holographic pancake arch thingamabob. All right. Uh, the second group out were the Usos, the tag team champions, because, you know, screw wrestling tradition. And as the Usos are coming out, I'm struggling to think who's the third team in this. I'm ticking off SmackDown tag teams in my head and realizing I saw most of them in the Battle Royal earlier. Well, it was the Bludgeon Brothers, and while the Bludgeon Brother gimmick is pretty stupid because they've got these enormous hammers that they don't really use, or can't really use because they kill somebody, uh, I really like Luke Harper. I knew him as Brody Lee in Chikara. And he's an incredible talent. I think he's undervalued, underpushed, and underrated by Vince McMahon. He's one of the best big man wrestlers, or as the athletic big man that I've ever seen. And in the end of this short and not particularly impressive match, your winners and the new SmackDown Tag Team Champions, the Bludgeon Brothers. So uh, Brody Lee joins Claudio Castagnoli as... Chikara alumni with smat with with WWE tag team gold. Congratulations to uh, Luke Harper and Eric Rowan. N the crowd was dead for this. This was the popcorn match, or at least it sounded like it. I saw quite a few people in the crowd sort of going off to con the concession stands, but I don't get the new day. I really don't get the new day. I've, I've done my history of American theater. Um, this is, yeah, this is, they're, they're getting as close to a minstrel show as they possibly can without actually doing a cakewalk and without actually doing um, somebody in blackface. But yeah, I don't, I don't find the new day f particularly funny. The, the pancake thing is stupid. Just, You've got three great wrestlers. Let them be three great wrestlers. Now, they're making a lot of money in merch. Credit to them on that. But, okay. Congratulations, Bludgeon Brothers, Tag Team Champions. Not sure what the next match is, but we're going to call this part two because i got to go get to work. Okay, what we're technically going to call part three of uh, the last wrestling podcast, WrestleMania Fleur de Lis review live ish. And uh, right now it is. Okay, it has just become April 12th. I believe that means it's Thursday. So it's just after midnight. And I am ready to continue watching WrestleMania Fleur de Lis. And John Cena has just come out. I'm assuming this is going to relate to The Undertaker story. So I'm going to watch whatever this angle turns into, and then I'll be back to talk about it. <laughs> Woo! Okay, this is why I love wrestling. Ah, oh, I'm sorry, I need, I need to have a refractory period after that. Oh, mwah! Okay, uh, John Cena comes out, which seems a little weird since he's not scheduled for a match. What's even weirder is it gets announced the following contest is scheduled for one fall. One fall. Well, he thought Taker was there and Taker was going to fight him. Well, the lights go out and out comes Elias Sampson doing his evil shitty folk singer gimmick. Okay, <laughs> but... Alright, so Elias does his incredibly long entrance, uh, which is deliberately annoying, so I'll give it uh, I'll give it a little bit of a pass on the whole wasting time at WrestleMania shtick. But, uh, very, very quick, 
not even really a match. Uh, John Cena goes back to his seat. Elias insults him and insults the crowd. Cena comes back in, uh, delivers uh, an, an Alcoholics Anonymous, and that's pretty much it. So Cena is walking his way up the ramp when his music cuts out. He looks around for a second, and then darkness, crowd goes nuts, lights on in the ring, and the Undertaker's hat, cloak, and boots are sitting in the ring. A little bit of a continuity error because he didn't take his boots off at WrestleMania uh, last year, but... That's the last we saw of the... By the way, for this, we're all going to pretend that Raw 25 never happened. Okay? Whatever the hell that Undertaker promo in the Manhattan Center was supposed to be, that never happened. <laughs> Let's just all agree to that right here, right now. This, the last time we saw Undertaker was WrestleMania last year. He appeared to retire, took off his coat, took off his hat, left his gear in the ring. That's an old, old, old sign that a professional wrestler is retiring when they leave their gear, most typically their boots, in the ring. And then he went up the ramp and descended down into the underworld, and we haven't seen him since. Well, the, the spotlight, the purple spotlight, appears in the ring. The coat and the hat are there, and then... Old school Undertaker lightning strikes the ring and the hat and coat vanish. Like, the, it's the spark of life to Frankenstein's monster resurrecting the Undertaker. Bong! You hear the knell of a requiem bell, weird glows gleam where the spirits dwell. As the Undertaker's music hits, he rises out of the stage, returning from the underworld like Hades in pursuit, in pursuit of Persephone. And he has answered the challenge of John Cena. What follows is the perfect Undertaker match for 2018. It was only a few minutes. It was 95% Undertaker offense. Cena got a couple of shots in. But Taker took almost no bumps from this. Hit all of his signature spots. Old school. Snake eyes. Uh, big boot. Although, and as, as I've always said on this, I'm not a wrestler. I shouldn't be critiquing moves or skill of a wrestler in the ring but um that big boot showed about as much light as a supernova <laughs> but he hit uh, hit the big boot hit the leg drop choke slam tombstone did the sit you know, you know he took one back bump off of the cena backdrop so he could do the sit up and credit to john cena brilliant selling on the undertaker's sit up John Cena is going for his signature masturbation fist drop, runs, he's bouncing off the ropes, and then just, the Undertaker sits up as Cena's bouncing off the ropes, and Cena just stops in mid-air, backpedals in mid-air, <laughs> in mid-run, and falls flat on his ass, which is a perfect sell to the Undertaker's sit-up. And then that was about it. Choke slam picks him up, Brilliant looking tombstone, one, two, three, the end. It wasn't a, a 30 minute classic. It was exactly what we needed to see from The Undertaker. We needed to see The Undertaker. We, last year, the last couple of years, we've seen, frankly, an aging Mark Calloway. Now we needed to see The Undertaker. And The Undertaker was there in New Orleans tonight, or whatever night that actually happened about. Oh, half a week ago now. But that was brilliant. This is not the end of this story. If they have any sense whatsoever, they're going to do what... They're going to do the year advance. Now, I have not seen the Raw after Mania. I have not seen the SmackDown after Mania. I've been, boy, I've been you know, bogarting myself away from all wrestling media. I don't know if they've done this. If they have, I take credit for the prediction. If they don't, well, I didn't know any better. This is the year in advance match. Book it a year in advance at WrestleMania 
technically 35 or WrestleMania, whatever visual symbol they choose to use, it will be John Cena versus The Undertaker at WrestleMania and have some, and I would make this Taker's last match. Have some sort of, you know, mutual career on the line stipulation or maybe... Uh, I'm hesitant to say this, but put the title back on John Cena, have him break Flair's record, because it's not his real record, and say it's title versus career, or career versus career, something like that. But that was cathartic for every Undertaker fan in the building, because he looked fantastic. He looked like The Undertaker. If I'm anywhere near that mobile and that athletic at that age, I will consider myself a very, very lucky individual. All right, looks like they're transitioning to the Hall of Fame. And uh, recap, I didn't actually see the Hall of Fame show, so I don't really know much about that. Uh, just running down the Hall of Fame class, uh, nobody who really stands out as unworthy uh, Goldberg was a big deal in the biggest part of, uh, in really the biggest boom in the history of wrestling. So he deserves to be in. Whether he deserves to be the headliner, I don't know. It was kind of a weak class. Uh, the Dudleys, they've worked everywhere. I've gotten to see them live. I've been literally a foot away from Bubba Ray, who is far larger than he appears in the WWE context. Um, he, uh, he was actually at a show at Krakwan Hall that I, I saw a couple of years ago. And, yeah, they're a great tag team. The most decorated tag team in history. Things a bit, um, a bit odd for me, but, uh, they're a great tag team. They certainly deserve to be in. Mark Henry, obviously, uh, you know, 20-year damn near veteran, so he's in. Jeff Jarrett was the big surprise of the season, of, of, of the class. But if you, if you count what he did in TNA, the fact that he created the closest thing that WWE has had to competition in the last 15 years, even though they weren't real comp really much of competition, then yeah, okay, I say I, he does deserve it. And if nothing else, the Jarrett family deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. Um, Ivory... You know what? Nostalgia, okay, she's in. Um, she was the serious woman's wrestler when I when I first started watching. She was the one who was fighting against the whole bra and panties, wrestling in you know pools of pudding crap. Um, didn't succeed, but I kind of like that about her. So borderline on whether or not she deserves it but far and away the best thing to ever come out of glow so okay fine she's in um celebrity wing the kid rock mm, at least he's got more of a he's got more of a connection to wrestling than half the people they put in that wing so whatever uh warrior award i'm not gonna heal on a kid but yeah, the Warrior Award needs to not exist. The Ultimate Warrior was a terrible person. And they can say, oh, no, 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 it's the character, it's the ideals of being a warrior. Yeah, no, sorry, as, as long as you have the, the Ultimate Warrior face paint logo on the trophy, it's about the Ultimate Warrior. And, yeah, he was a terrible person. So, screw this. And also, it's not what he wanted the Warrior Award to be. The Ultimate Warrior wanted the Warrior Award to be about the guys backstage, the people who make WWE work behind the scenes. This is where Vince's limo driver gets in. This is where Jim Johnson, who wrote all the music you've ever liked in wrestling, that's where he goes in. This is where Kevin Dunn goes in. This is, you know, etc. But no, they decided to make it the Charity Pandering Award, so Shogunai. Nothing we can do about it. All right, I'm, I'm going to watch the recap, and then if there's anything else, I'll, I'll mention it, but uh, we'll move on to the next match. Okay, quick note from the recap. I forgot about Hillbilly Jim. Uh, no, I don't know if he really deserves to be in there or not. He's from way before I started watching, so no comment. 
Seems like a nice guy. Good for him. Okay, now that I actually see him, I kind of like that J.J. Darius kid. He looked fun. Um, I love that the Dudleys put the guy that tried to tell them to give him the wrap-up cue. I love that they put him through a table. Fantastic. Another quick note, why the hell isn't Howard Finkel announcing these people? For that matter, why the hell isn't Howard Finkel announcing everything? Okay, uh, are they planning on having Goldberg come back for another run? Because I think they're planning on Goldberg coming back for another run, and I do not think that is a good idea. He went out as well as he could possibly go out. So I do, I do like the fact, and I hope it's true, when he said in his speech that he's found a love for what he does in the WWE and in WCW as well. Because he will, he was, he has a reputation for being the guy who, well, frankly, didn't really like wrestling all that much. And wrestling is so, it's so damaging to your body. It's so, it's such a commitment of your life that uh, I, I equate it to teaching in some ways that if you don't love it, you should not be doing it. So, you know, I really hope Goldberg has found a love for professional wrestling. Okay, okay, up next, the match I didn't think was going to happen. Daniel Bryan is back, along with Shane McMahon, versus Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn. This is incredible. If you had told me a few years ago that there would be a WrestleMania match featuring the American Dragon Bryan Danielson, Mr. Wrestling Kevin Steen, and someone who looks suspiciously like El Generico, um... Yeah, I wouldn't have believed it, but okay. Um, I'm worried going into this match. I haven't actually watched it yet. Brian, I understand he's been working on a new in-ring style that will protect his head and neck, where it's more tumbling instead of, you know, flat bumps. I hope that is the case. Shane McMahon coming off of apparently a bout with diverticulitis, which is very serious nothing to laugh at but i'm so i'm worried about the, both of those guys in the ring but owens and sammy Zayn, i would uh, i would trust them to to protect their opponents and so we're going into this match eyes wide open uh, the stipulate this is a tag team match the stipulation if kevin and sammy win that they will be reinstated as WWE competitors, superstars, whatever. Uh, they were fired by Daniel Bryan on SmackDown a couple weeks ago, apparently, as part of the setup for this. And hopefully this will be the end of the feud between Owen Zane and McMahon Bryan. And hopefully whatever tension they've got between Bryan and McMahon that they've been building for what seems like about 40 years now... Hopefully that's all going to get blown off here because I am really, really, really sick of this. It's why I haven't been watching SmackDown. Okay, WWE creative are just hitting on all cylinders tonight. Uh, once again, this was a perfect Daniel Bryan match. Daniel Bryan is the underdog. Uh, so they needed to create even more sympathy than he already had, this being his return after, I think, three years now of being out of action. So, uh, the match was mostly... They did it, again, there was some smoke and mirrors to cover for the fact that Shane was hurt. Brian, of course, wins in the end, so the question becomes, what do you do with uh, uh, Zane and Owens? I would just have them move over to Raw. They've been fired from SmackDown, but the authority figures on SmackDown have no control over Raw. So that's the easy solution there. Uh, for as, as for what do you do with Daniel Bryan going forward? Uh, oh, oh, just to clarify on what I meant by um, building sympathy. Owens and Zayn attacked uh, before the bell, from behind, through the crowd, which perfect is exactly what you should do for that. Uh, they don't need to have entrances, because technically they're, they don't work there. And they powerbombed Brian against the ring apron. Which is good, because that's a shot to the back, not the neck. 
uh, two on one with Shane for a little bit. Brian comes back in, hits all of his signature spots, finishes uh, Sami Zayn, I believe it was, off with the uh, the flying knee and the yes lock for the one, two, three. Short, sweet, simple, very, very good. Exactly what it needed to be. The uh, the baby, the uh, the underdog hero overcoming the odds. And uh, credit to the the heel work by Owens and Zayn. Because throughout the match, they were yelling loud enough to be picked up by the mics that this is your fault. Why are you making us do this to you? Why are you hitting yourself? Why are you hitting yourself? Why are you hitting yourself? Great sort of bully trying to justify their actions work by, by these two. Well done. Now, the question is, where do you go with Brian from here? Um... Obviously, he doesn't need to be SmackDown Commissioner anymore, or SmackDown General Manager anymore. Uh, presumably, they're going to come up with a new General Manager either this coming week or, or the next... Well, it's already aired, and I don't know what happened. But they need to come up with a new with new authority figures for SmackDown. I think we are firmly in the era of the special attraction for Daniel Bryan. He does not need to be wrestling every week. He needs to be very smart about what he does. Oh, and by the way, when I said he did all his signature spots, you know what he didn't do? The stupid headbutt. Honestly, if if I'm working in WWE right now, I tell Daniel Bryan, if you even tease doing that headbutt again, you are fired, and even worse, I'm going to make you sit home the rest of your contract. You know, just actually no. I wouldn't even. I wouldn't even pay him. No, 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 no. Because he sits home, he gets paid. If he does the flying head, but again, or even teases it, he's gone. I yeah. I would instruct the referee to shoot, stop the match, and say, okay, that's it. He's out. That's how serious they need to take this. WWE, I think they've got some. They've got something with Brian. The the entrance that they did for him with. I'm, what I'm guessing was Vanguard 1. <laughs> um, I think it's actually the same graphic package. Followed by uh, a bunch of people around the world doing the Yes chant. And that sort of transitioning back into Daniel Bryan. I thought that was excellent. Again, they when they, deci when they have decided to do special entrances, they've been nailing it. It was very, very well done. Okay, next match. <sighs> next match, I say at 1.30 in the morning is for the Raw Women's Championship. It's Alexa Bliss defending against Nia Jax. And the story is very simple. It's the bully finally getting her comeuppance against the big girl that she's been mocking for however long. A lot of really simple stories this year, and I think that's good. I think it's important to stick to the storytelling basics now if they've got any if they've, if they've got the good sense of a hubcap then Nia Jax is going to be the women's champion at the end of this but I have no guarantee that that's going to happen all right here we go okay again 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 the match was exactly what it needed to be Okay, a lot of people are have complained about the character of Alexa Bliss. Specifically the fact that she's not credible as a professional wrestler because she's a five foot nothing waif <laughs> for all intents and purposes. But that's exactly what her character is. She's not big, she's not strong, so she's crafty. She's manipulative. She cheats. In the ring, of course, but she also manipulates other people. And that's how this whole storyline got started. Her manipulating Nia Jax into being her, her heavy, essentially. And even whenever you watch an Alexa Bliss match, she's always doing things deliberately in order to make up for her lack of size. She's doing things where, you know, she uses the ropes to get a height advantage or to give herself additional momentum when she comes crashing down on somebody. She's not tr she's not body slamming people, but she's kicking them, she's punching them, she's ducking and dodging. 
her in-ring style fits her character, and that is so important in pro wrestling. Nia Jax winning this and being portrayed as this is vicarious justice for everyone who's ever been body shamed, who's ever been told that they're too big, they're too ugly, they're too fat. And a nice little subtle thing in Nia Jax's ring gear that I will assume was deliberate. A little more sexy than usual. Nia Jax typically wears very conservative bodysuits. But today she had a more skin-tight outfit and a large uh, mesh cleavage window that uh, showed off a good chunk of her chest. And I like to think, I want to think that this is the character sort of owning her body, owning her sexuality, because, you know, she's a big girl, but she is a very attractive woman. And I, I kind of like that it fits the character that she's showing that off a little bit in this match. Um, Alexa Bliss uh, lost after an avalanche uh, Samoan drop off, I think, the second rope. And I'm glad they didn't try to do that from the top. And Nia Jax is your new Raw Women's Champion. Although, anytime they do a bullying storyline, I it, it's kind of like with the Finn Balor LGBTQ entrance uh, about an hour ago now, at least on this recording. And I know this is running long, but um, this is a seven-hour show. I've got it condensed into just over an hour so far, and I've got... Oh, God, about an hour and a half left to go on the show. So I'm, I'm cutting out a lot here. Like the Finn Balor thing, I can't help but think about who's running this show. Vince McMahon is a bully. He finds bully humor to be funny. He basically, he portrays the bullies as the good guys a lot of the time. And people who stand up against injustice, if you get screwed over... You're not supposed to point that out. You know, hey, I got screwed. You're supposed to suck it up and take it like a man. Well, yeah, Vince McMahon is a bully. He encourages a culture of bullying in his business. And anytime he does the anti-bully storyline, it comes across as... I hate to use the F word in wrestling, but it comes across as fake. But this was probably the best version of that I've ever seen in WWE. I like Nia Jax. I like Alexa Bliss as a character. This is this was a great match. It wasn't a technical five star classic, but it told. It had a simple, a simple but effective story going into it. It told the story well. The right person won. It was well booked, well executed. Fantastic job. Okay, the next match on the card, and we're getting down here, and I hope this one gets a nice long run of time to go. It's Styles Nakamura for the WWE Championship, and I'm actually going to stop for right now because it's 2 o'clock in the morning, and I, I'm i looking forward to this match. I've seen what these two can do when they're allowed to just go crazy, and... I want to be fully awake for it. So we're going to call that the end of part three, and we'll be back with part four whenever I get around to it. Well, that was the thing that just happened. I'm back. This is part four of WrestleMania Fleur de Lis Review Live-ish. And I just saw... Nakamura Shinsuke turn heel on AJ Styles. But that's not the biggest story of this match, if you ask me. The story of this match, the thing that I think we all need to remember going forward, is that WWE can not be New Japan. They cannot tell the two warriors fighting with honor for a championship. They cannot tell the two clashing styles. They cannot tell the athletes on a natural sports-like journey. 
They just can't do this. They can't be Okada and Naito. They can't be, you know, another good example. They can't be Suzuki and Tanahashi. They they just can't do this. This match, again, it served its purpose, I guess, but this was a dud. This was dull to watch. It felt like, now maybe somebody or both were dealing with injuries that I don't know about, but that's the only excuse I can think of because these guys never really got out of first gear. Um, it was kind of back and forth. There was a long spot in the middle where AJ had the, uh, the calf crusher, as they call it now. And Nakamura tried to get out of it. AJ rolls him back in the center of the ring. It was okay. The finish was pretty inventive. The finish was essentially AJ ducking and dodging the Kinshasa, or the Bombaye, and turning it into a Styles Clash. And I thought that was a pretty good counter. I love when one finisher gets countered into another. So credit there. But the entire the entire match was leading up to what happened after the match. AJ Styles wins uh, after off of a Styles Clash. Nakamura, in what appears to be a show of sportsmanship, respect, honor, etc., he takes the belt from the referee... Genuflex gets down on one knee and presents the championship to AJ Styles, essentially acknowledging tonight you are the better man, you have earned this holy prize. But that was just a setup for him to punch AJ in the nuts. Nakamura proceeds to beat the crap out of AJ, who's left lying as AJ leaves. Sorry, as Nakamura leaves the arena. Huge disappointment. Uh, I can't help but think that if Gato had been booking this match, if New Japan had been putting this match on, this would have been a hell of a lot better than it was. It was an afterthought from the word go. It, I mean, yes, they gave Nakamura the, the Royal Rumble victory. Huge. Never thought they would do that. I'm guessing they had this heel turn planned all along, and that's the only saving grace I can think of for this match, is that this is part one of the story because Vince doesn't know how to tell the I don't hate you I respect you but I want to prove that I'm better than you I think I'm the best you think you're the best you've got the title that means you're right and I want to take it from you I, I bear no ill will against you but we are both professional athletes we are both fighters we are both wrestlers we each want to be the best, and whoever has that belt, they're the best. You have it. I want to take it from you. Let's fight. Fighting spirit. Let's fight with honor. Let's prove who is the better man. Vince doesn't know how to tell that story. So, yeah. Uh, so far, with the U U.S. title Fatal 4-Way as really the only competition, worst match of the night but hopefully it will be redeemed in history as we go forward with this uh, nakamura heel turn and hopefully this is just the first act of the story with him and aj styles because i know these two are better than this okay um after some recaps of the pre-show we have a big Mardi Gras float comes out, and I'm thinking, oh, God, they're, they're going to put a concert in the middle of the show. Oh, oh, God, oh, God, no. And But actually, it turns out that it's The Bar. Claudio Castagnoli, or uh, Antonio Cesaro, and his partner Seamus O'Shaughnessy coming out on the big Mardi Gras float because we're in New Orleans and we need to pander. And they've got Mardi Gras beads. It's not... Okay, I've never been to New Orleans. But one thing I know, if you want to mark yourself as an idiot tourist, wear Mardi Gras beads when it's not Mardi Gras. 
You don't do that in New Orleans, from what I understand. Anyone from New Orleans, if I'm wrong about that, please leave a comment and tell me what an idiot I am. But the next match appears to be The Bar versus Braun Strowman and Question Mark. I want there to be a wrestler named Question Mark. But the story here, and this is... I hate when wrestling makes me accept the stupid. And there is some real stupid in this. But Braun Strowman, a, couple, a few weeks ago, won a tag team battle royal without a partner. And that made him number one contenders for the tag team titles. That was stupid. That should not have been allowed to happen. Now, if they want to argue that Braun inserted himself into the match when he shouldn't have been there and threw everybody out and claimed number one contender status, that would have been fine except for the fact he had his full ring entrance at the time and that gave too much legitimacy to his appearance. That was dumb, but there was significantly less dumb uh, following the match, following the Battle Royal, because Commissioner Kurt Angle decided that, sorry, General Manager Kurt Angle, Stephanie I think is still technically the Commissioner of Raw, uh, Angle basically said, look, okay, you've got the number one contendership, but you've got to find a partner, and if you don't, no title match. Which, that at least makes some sense. A couple of companies over the years, including Kurt Angle and TNA, have done a thing where one man holds both tag team titles. When that happens, you assassinate your entire tag team division. Don't do it. So, we still don't know who Strowman's tag team partner is. Uh, they've done a pretty good job keeping that as a mystery. Unfortunately, they did make it a joke occasionally. But the idea is the bar is going into this with a little bit of a handicap, an excuse when they lose, because they don't know who he's going to come out with. They don't know who Braun's partner is going to be. If I'm booking this, two possibilities. One, and this is my actual, what I would really do. James Ellsworth. Bring back James Ellsworth. They've got uh, one because the, the visual will be really funny. It'll be something Vince would like. Two, Strowman can pick up Ellsworth and, you know, use him as a lawn dart or as a flail or basically use him as a human weapon. And three, it would be humiliating for Braun Strowman to beat up both members of the bar, tag in Ellsworth, tell him to make the cover, one, two, three, new champions. It, I, it's the type of humor I think Vince McMahon would like, and I, it's the kind of humor, and for the rare occasion we cross over here, it's the type of thing that I like in, a, in an odd couple tag team. That's one. Two, stooge. Have a stooge, have a plant, uh, some performance center guy, some local worker, somebody, and have them in the crowd at ringside, maybe one of the people who was sitting next to Cena, but none of them looked like wrestlers, and basically have Strowman grab this person out of the crowd and say, you're my partner now. Stand here, shut up, let me do this. And you get to be champion. Um... I, the Ellsworth thing sounds better because at least that's a name that people know. And there's also the uh, crossover with Ellsworth with the, the, the catchphrases and the history. Uh, Braun Strowman has the catchphrase, catch these hands. And Ellsworth had, any man with two hands has a fighting chance. Or two fists has a fighting chance, I think it may have been said. And James Ellsworth was introduced to WWE uh, as a jobber being fed to Braun Strowman. So they have that history. And actually, the more I talk myself out of into this and out of this, uh, yeah, go with James Ellsworth. Don't do the stooge. That Unless, you're, unless you've got a new character you intend to introduce, like Santino Marella uh, winning the Intercontinental title when he first... Uh, uh, the Milan Miracle. And actually, even that didn't work. They had to make him a comedy guy. So yeah, James Ellsworth is my prediction and what I would do if I was booking this. So here we go, Mardi Gras float. Yay. Okay, stop right there. Bar comes out, they're throwing Mardi Gras beads because they're idiots, but Corey 
fucking graves just made the joke, if this is how we're doing it, then bring me a hurricane. Dude! Go to hell! I know you're a heel, but fuck you. I swear to God, I didn't know that's what they were gonna do. Okay, um... It's a kid! It's a kid. Haven't actually seen the match yet, but I have just seen Braun Strowman select a child from the audience to be his tag team partner. At first blush, this is stupid. At second blush, this is really stupid. At third blush, this is genius. If there's anyone I would trust with a kid in the ring, it's Cesaro. Um, if there's anyone I trust to take something really goofy and make it work and play it straight, it's a Chikara Hall of Famer <laughs> like Cesaro. Like Cesaro. Like uh, Claudio Castagnoli. Um... I kind of like this. They're doing going for a straight babyface turn with, or, or, or cementing Strowman as, as a babyface. I'm kind of wondering, is this kid going to be at future events? Because I'm with this setup, it's got to be Braun and the kid winning the titles. Or is Braun going to choose a different person to be his tag team partner under like a, a, a Braun Strowman version of the Freebird rules? Is he going to just pick a new champion, uh, a new partner every show? Every title defense? I kind of like that idea. Okay, so no, no more cheating. Actually watch the, the show now. They used a stooge. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Braun okay, I, again, I swear to God, the whole stooge in the... In, in, in the audience thing was not something I planned. Um, <laughs> okay, so yeah, Braun Strowman and Nicholas are now your Raw Tag Team Champions. And the crowd loved it. I thought they were going to shit all over this. But no, they loved this. There was We Want Nicholas chants immediately when the, when the match finally got started. And Nicholas did tag in for a second. And again, he was opposite Cesaro. And again, the Chikara alumni, the idea of having a kid in a match, that's been done in Chikara. Los Ice Creams have tagged, have had trios matches with a kid. They've been pinned by kids, but... This... I, I completely believe this. This is fantastic. Um, I did a little research on Wikipedia. It turns out... Well, first of all, I was spoiled on something that apparently happens on Monday Night Raw. Apparently, Nicholas and uh, Strowman relinquish the titles because, obviously, this is about a thousand lawsuits waiting to happen. But I also found out that Nicholas is... And I'm going to, you know, kayfabe... You know, no kayfabe here... Uh, he's the son of one of the referees. His uh, full name is Nicholas Cohn, and he's the son of one of the WWE referees. So, yeah, he was in on this from the beginning. He's a stooge, and you know what? Um, WWE doesn't do comedy very well. This was high freaking hilarious. All right, looking at the clock, we've got about 38 minutes left in the show. I'm going to power through the rest of this. I think there's only one match left, and it is the main. It is going to be the main event. Brock Lesnar versus Roman Reigns. There might be something in between, but let's find out. They also announced that WWE WrestleMania will be returning to New York City for next year, and I don't particularly care. The show is either a good show or a bad show, it doesn't really matter where it is. And it looks like it will be WrestleMania Liberty Crown. It looks like the crown of the Statue of Liberty on the, uh, on the logo there. What the hell did I just see? Um. Um. 
Has Vince given up on Roman Reigns? They have spent years building to this. Years. Roman Reigns loses still champion Brock freaking Lesnar. What the hell? What? What? This is nuts. Okay, okay. Um, uh, entrances. Plain, boring, normal entrances with their original and normal pyro. So, nothing interesting there. The match itself was okay. Um, at least for the, the first two-thirds of it. But I think a few things went wrong. A couple of throws into the announce tables didn't really look like they were intended to happen. And Roman Reigns, in the last couple minutes of the match, he gets opened up across the forehead hard. I think it was a an elbow strike from a legit elbow strike or two or three from Brock Lesnar. Reigns was dripping in his own blood. It was, it was uncomfortable to watch. This was like Lucha Underground shit. And by the way, I love Lucha Underground, but they do go over the, the top of the blood. This was more blood than I've seen in WWE since, well, actually since Lesnar opened up, uh, uh, Randy Orton a couple of years ago. But, whoo! I want to know what happened here, because, the I mean, the crowd uh, was dumping on this. I was hearing, this is awful. I was hearing, we want Nicholas, uh, the, the kid who's now tag team champion. Yeah, this, this didn't work. I don't know what, I don't know what's going on here. I want, I want to learn more about this, because... This was obviously supposed to be Reigns' crowning moment. It was removed. I don't know why. I Something's going on here. I don't know what, but I'm going to find out if I can. Okay, uh, the overall show, I'm going to give an A-. minus. Almost everything on this show worked. Um, it loses, by the way, the top rank is A+. Plus. It loses half a rank because, it loses half a letter grade because this was a seven-hour show. I only watched, actually, no, I watched a little more than five hours of it. Uh, it's too long. No way. This was ridiculous. At least two or three of these matches, I'm sorry, didn't need to be here. Two, it loses the other half because two of the biggest matches were the two worst. The I don't know what the hell went wrong in Reigns and Lesnar. I don't think the blood was intentional. Vince is big on no more blood. Um, I've seen rumors that there was some kind of a blow up between Vince and Reigns afterward. I imagine that's what it was over. Uh, and the Shinsuke Nakamura AJ Styles match wasn't as good as it should have been. All in all, almost everything on the show worked. Unfortunately, the few flaws that we had were big ones. The two title matches were duds. The U.S. title match didn't need to be there. Um, I don't know if this was the right time to end Oscar's streak. I'm intrigued by what's going on with The Undertaker. And I'm, for the most part, actually more looking forward to seeing what happens in WWE than I have been in a very long time because some of these things I see good potential in where they could go and in others I don't know where they're going with some of this so it, it was a successful show all in all that is it for last wrestling podcast Wrestlemania flirtily review live ish if you like this format and want me to do more of these sort of live ish reviews let me know in the comments below. Like, share, and subscribe. Blah, 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 blah. You know how this works. Thank you very much. Witty sign off.